my absolute pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, the Venerable Rod Bauer. If you want to make your way to this... Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, Father Rod is the social media friendly rector of Gos Gosford, where he has served for 19 years and is the Archdeacon for Justice. And there's another title that I didn't know existed, and I'm adding that to my list of things that I didn't know existed but I love. He's the man that's known to his followers as Father Rod and is committed to building social and cultural capital and contributing to the evolution of an Australia where there is respect, peace and harmony. Since 2013, Father Rod has been using his church signs, yes, that's where you know him from, those amazing church signs, amplified by Twitter and Facebook to send a message on a number of social and human rights issues, gaining worldwide notoriety in the process. Unfortunately for all of us, Father Rod was not elected as a New South Wales Senator on the weekend. I would definitely have voted for him if I could have. Um, but this does not mean his influence will be lacking in coming years. With a large following and his famous church signs, Father Rod is set to continue his quest for social justice in this country. Please make him very welcome. Thank you very much. So we're going to try and get you out. Um, I'm just going to press my little... This tells me to shut up. The kids gave this Apple Watch to me a couple of years ago and suggested it would be really well used in sermons because <laughs> it's got a timer on it, so I'm using it right now. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, getting angry and, uh, and then getting organised. Well, I'm angry. Don't know about you. Are you angry? <laughs> yes. uh, so we're all angry. Let's start to get a little bit organised. Anger is, of course... Uh, the human natural response to injustice. Whenever we feel a little bit of injustice, our natural response is, uh, is anger. Uh, that's what the terrible twos are all about when we get the throw down and the screaming and the kicking. Uh, that's that, that first dawning consciousness uh, that we live in a world that uh, sometimes just isn't just. Uh, and so that's why we are angry. Uh, I was born into injustice. Uh, any society that takes a child away from its mother, uh, when that child is, uh, when that mother is uh, perfectly capable of raising that child, if surrounded by a just society uh, where that mother belongs, uh, that society is quite simply unjust. And so I've spent the last uh, 56 years being angry uh, because I've spent the last 56 years uh, deeply conscious of the, the lack of justice within our society. Uh, but now I've got something else to be angry about because I've now got grandchildren uh, in an unjust society. Uh, this is the oldest of uh, my four grandchildren. This is Isabella Rose, or Izzy, as she likes to be called, or Munchkin, as I call her. Uh, Izzy just uh, had her, uh, her ninth birthday. Uh, we hired an uh, indoor climbing centre and uh, about a dozen of her friends gathered together, uh, climbed, and, uh, and then it, it came to the cake time, uh, and so uh, it was a Pokemon party. Uh, and the cake was uh, vegan. Uh, Izzy has decided uh, about uh, three or four years ago, uh, she said, uh, Pa, if, uh, if we eat all the little lambs, there'll be no little lambs left. And so Izzy has chosen to be a vegetarian uh, because she's a, she's a person who is quite interested in, in justice issues that surround her. So the, uh, to keep uh, everybody uh, comfortable at the, uh, at the party, uh, the cake was uh, vegan, gluten-free and nut-free, uh, and it was very tasty. Uh, and it all went very well until we came to the cutting of the cake, uh, where Pikachu sustained a <laughs> mortal wound. <laughs> and we had 12 traumatised little kids. <laughs> and my grandson, who is three, uh, was hiding under the table and was vowing never to eat cake again <laughs> because Pikachu had, uh, had uh, befallen the knife. Well, this was a special day for my granddaughter because 
uh, she was surrounded by friends. Uh, and that's not something uh, that has been easy for Izzy. Uh, this uh, little video is uh, Isabella uh, six years ago. I did helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, sodium, potassium. When Izzy was three, she could recite the periodic table. <laughs> now I'm going to get all upset. <laughs> Izzy's superpower is autism. Uh, but that means she finds it difficult uh, to find belonging. Uh, she was uh, homeschooled for a, a little while, but then she decided that she uh, wanted to go to school. And it was such an exciting day when she got her school uniform. She didn't know uh, what a school uniform really meant, uh, but she knew that it was really cool to have one. Uh, and so uh, off she went to school on her first day. But the trouble is, on, uh, on her first day, uh, Izzy decided that uh, she wanted to teach the class. <laughs> and... The teacher didn't respond in a particularly helpful way uh, to Izzy wanting to teach the class. Uh, and, uh, and she was basically uh, given the message that uh, she had to fit in. And she said to me, um, Pa, they, they, want us to they want us to fit in. They want us all to be the same. And I'm an individual. So Izzy's uh, foray into the education system uh, was, was very unproductive because uh, she's not a little girl who fits in easily, but a little girl with a desperate desire to belong. Uh, and Izzy learnt, and I think I begin, began to learn and to reflect and to understand even more deeply that belonging and fitting in are not the same thing. Uh, to fit in, she had to be something that she wasn't. She had to deny something of herself. Uh, and that is the opposite to belonging. Because we can only belong when we are truly ourselves, when we are truly who we are. And she went off uh, to guides. Uh, they live in a tiny little town up in, in the Pilbara at the time. Now, while guides had a, uh, a uniform, like just like school had a uniform, uh, they had rules and regulations and all sorts of other things that are very important, just like the school does. But the agenda for this little group wasn't about fitting in. It was about belonging. And that made all the difference to Izzy. All of a sudden, she began to feel that she belonged uh, and that she didn't just have to fit in. Fitting in is the responsibility of the individual. Uh, it's something that we as individuals feel that we just have to do. But belonging is the responsibility of the entire community. And that's what we have to be on about. Because each and every one of us struggles to belong sometimes. Did anybody wake up on Sunday morning and feel as though they, they belonged a little less than they did on Friday morning? Why was that? Why did we feel we belonged less uh, on Sunday morning? Uh, Kerry was up until 2 o'clock on, on, uh, on Sunday morning on her phone looking for jobs for me in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because all of a sudden we, we felt we, we didn't belong as much as we did uh, because there was, there was something going on uh, that made us feel... Uh, we didn't quite fit in the same way. And that's a, that's a really important thing to remember when we, when we start to think about 
um, people that we may not agree with uh, or we, we may not feel comfortable with, people who are different to us. Uh, because I'm an adopted person, I grew up uh, in, a, in, in, the, in, in almost in exactly the place where your, uh, uh, your school programs are going, in the Hunter Valley. Uh, and in the valley I grew up in, there was a, a high level of familial identity. Everybody was related to everybody else, uh, except me. Uh, and I had a lovely family, a wonderful family, and, uh, who loved me very much and, and communicated how, how much I was wanted and all of that kind of stuff. But still, uh, there was that nagging sense that I didn't belong. I can, I can clearly remember the day I was having this... Uh, uh, testosterone competition with uh, an, another 12-year-old, uh, as young boys do, uh, and we were arguing about whose family had been in the valley for the longest. Uh, and uh, it came to a stalemate uh, at about uh, six generations where we both came to the same great-great-great-great-grandfather. And then he said, ''Ah, oh, but that doesn't count because you're adopted.'' And it was, it was kind of like that deep sense of I don't belong and so I've just got to try harder and harder to deny who I am and to, and to fit in with everybody else. Uh, and that for pretty much destroyed my entire adolescence, to be honest, uh, because as I grew, I, I continued to get into this habit that I started to deny who I was. I, I left school as early as I could and I got a job uh, in a shop in Newcastle. And one of, the, one of the, uh, uh, the jobs for the apprentice was to go out every morning and to sweep the footpath. Uh, and, a, and another friend of mine from school who, who escaped school at the same time as I did, he got a job at the BHP and he, he used to catch the bus just outside the shop of a morning. Uh, he was a, a, a Torres Strait Islander boy. And so I'd go out in the morning, I'd sweep the footpath and I'd say day to Wayne uh, and then I'd come back in. Until one morning a new manager uh, began in the shop and I went out and I swept the footpath and I had a chat with Wayne uh, and then I came back in uh, and he just looked at me, I can still remember it, over the top of his glasses in that intimidating way that the older people look at younger people. And he said, so... You talk to blackfellas, do you? And from that day on, I waited till Wayne got on the bus before I went out to sweep. What's going on there? What's going on there is that, that desperate need we have to, to fit in, uh, to deny ourselves, to deny our friends even, so that we can fit in. But this workplace wasn't a workplace of belonging. It was a workplace of, of fitting in. It's because of what we call a, a domination system. Domination systems uh, are not about belonging, they're about uh, making people deny who they are and fit in. And, and, and all cultures have them and they, they normally have five elements. They normally have a, an ethnic, a cultural, a, 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 a spiritual, a gender and, and, and a sexuality uh, um, dynamic. Um, we mostly live in a, uh, in a, in a, in a white Western uh, male, sorry ladies, but you know, you only, you only had walk out to near the, where the toilets were during the break uh, and you know the blokes are in charge, don't you? Because all the women are lined up to go to the loo and the men are just walking straight in and out. Uh, so it's, uh, we still live in this... Uh, um, uh, male, psychologically dominated, heterosexual, psychically dot Western, um, white Western. Uh, but, and that requires people to, to deny just a little bit of who they are so that they can fit in. And for every one of those boxes you can't tick, it just gets that little bit harder. Because we live in a society that's about fitting in and maybe that's why we felt a little bit less at home on Sunday morning than we were comfortable with. 
um, because we're afraid that it could be a little bit more about fitting in uh, than it is about belonging. And so, what are we to do? There's a lot there to get angry about. Uh, but how do we get organised? Well, I think one of the, the first things we have to do when we want to think about belonging uh, is to... I'm going to have to skip over a few of these things here. There we go, because uh, we're short of time. The first thing we need to do in this place, if we want to think about belonging, is listen to the people who have belonged here for 65,000 years. Because they were, they were a group of people who, are, who were incredibly different, one from the other, and yet had this deep sense of belonging. 500 nations, 800 languages, all existing and thriving in the same place. So belonging has got something to do with sharing that same space, that same place, walking on that, that same land. And in doing so, sharing that same humanity. We're going to hear a lot about what it means to be Australian over the next three years. We're going to hear a lot about uh, what Australian culture is over the next three years. And we're going to hear a lot about fitting in to that, especially if you belong to a minority group of some description. But we have to remember and keep talking about there are only two things that are required to belong here. And that is a consciousness that we walk gently on the same land, in the same place. And that we do so recognising each other's humanity. That's what belonging is about. That's the place that we have to start. I was very active in the marriage equality um, campaign. And that was because I think belonging is about participating in the same civic universe as everyone else. When we don't, we don't participate in the same civic universe, then we can't belong together. And when, when human rights are divorced from belonging, then it becomes confusing for everyone. The first place to begin with human rights uh, is the place of belonging. Uh, and when some people don't belong quite as much as someone else, then their human rights are indeed in jeopardy. So what do we do? What do we do with those people in a just society, if, if all justice is social, if all justice is really comes down to, to everyone belonging, then what do we do with the people that we find it hard to belong with? How do we, don't, how do we stop from other rising? How do we actually delight in the unique otherness of the other? which creates a healthy society. You may um, recognise this guy from Melbourne. He's one of yours. I don't want to claim him. Uh, he was in court the other day. Uh, he invaded a, um, a gay church last Sunday. Uh, not yesterday, the night before. His name is uh, Neil Erickson. And uh, he invaded our uh, worship uh, about a, a, a year ago. Actually, was in, obviously was in Ramadan this time last year uh, because of my support for the Islamic community, uh, in, especially in Sydney and New South Wales. Now, what he did to us was incredibly traumatic, and he did it again to another church only uh, a couple of Sundays ago. He invaded with a loud hailer and... Um, 
uh, traumatised uh, our congregation. It's happened to us a, a number of times now. But what I recognise in him uh, is a deep sense of not feeling he belongs anymore. The world is changing around him. Uh, he, he belongs, he thinks, to a, a white, western, male, nominally Christian, heterosexual, dominated society. And that's changing around him and he just doesn't know what to do about it. Uh, he thinks he benefits and his group benefit from that white male western uh, nominally christian heterosexual uh, community where in fact they really don't they don't have a job uh, they don't have any life partners uh, they they are you know they don't benefit from the society that they uh, uh, that they are, are trying to hold up and hold together uh, just as the people who voted for Donald Trump in the United States, most supportive of Donald Trump are the people who benefit from least from his regime. And sadly, what we will find over the next three years, uh, the same uh, dynamic here. The Queensland miners, for instance, will least benefit from the vote that they cast last Saturday. Uh, if they'd have uh, voted for renewables and renewable manufacturing and uh, uh, they would have job security uh, well into this century. So why do we do that? Why do we uh, shoot ourselves in the foot so much and why, why do we uh, uh, support structures that actually don't help us? Because they create the illusion of belonging. But it is an illusion because it's not really about belonging, it's just about fitting in. I was asked a question uh, the other day, I was doing an interview and um, this very insightful young person uh, asked the question, who would you most like to have lunch with? Um, and all these names, I said, that they have to be alive because I wouldn't actually mind having lunch with Jesus because I kind of like to really know what he was on about. <laughs> Uh, then I thought, oh, maybe Barack Obama, he'd be a really cool person to have lunch with, love to have lunch with. And, but then I remembered I'd put up this sign uh, and I said, well, actually, if I'm all about belonging, if I believe belonging is uh, the, the pathway uh, to better communities, to healthier communities, then the person I really need to have lunch with is Pauline Hanson. The person whose humanity I really need to be able to see and understand and connect with more deeply uh, is Pauline Hanson and, uh, and, and Neil Erickson and, and those people. Now, I, I don't pretend for one moment that I would enjoy that lunch. <laughs> But it's the lunch we need to have. Uh, because until people who push the kind of policies that divide people can actually feel that they themselves belong, then they will continue to behave in the way they are behaving. So when we go out, uh, my watch is now buzzing on my uh, arm, uh, when we go back to our workplaces with our, with our anger, uh, and it's an anger that is real and valid because our society is not yet just. Go back into our jobs, our neighbourhoods, our communities, our workplaces with the question... How deeply do I feel I belong? How deeply does the person that I'm speaking with, how deeply do, do they feel they belong? And when we've asked those two questions, the next question is always, how can we together 
create a deeper sense of belonging. And it is when we have done that that some of the answers to the other questions will just become so beautifully and manifestly obvious to us. Thank you very much, Rod. Let's just...